I'm standing at the most easterly point of the mainland of Australia, the rocky tip of Cape Byron with the wonderful Byron Bay behind me. Certainly not the first person to enjoy the view here. In fact, it's been an important and sacred site to the Aboriginal people of the Bundjalung Nation for many thousands of years. It's also been a spot that many travellers have come down to visit, to have a look at the glorious scenery and reflect on the place itself. And I've found a vision that was written down a long time ago by a traveller who came to Cape Byron in 1885. Now to put that in perspective, Byron as a European settlement is just setting up shop then. In fact, it hasn't yet got its enormous jetty, which once upon a time went right out into the water here, or the train line which will connect it to the hinterland in the 1890s. There was perhaps one shack in all of Byron at the time, located around the corner, belonging to a guy called Jarman, who was probably selling liquor to the local cedar cutters of the area. So it's a pretty untouched place at the time, and our traveller is reflecting on that. He says, the place is picturesque to a degree. The boldness of the Cape, the long even stretch of beach northward in an almost semicircle towards the Brunswick River, in conjunction with the magnificent semi-tropical vegetation which covers the coast range coming down to the edge of the beach, constitute a picture whose grandeur none can excel. Standing on the furthest most point on a clear day with the mighty Pacific rolling in at one's feet, what strange thoughts pass through the brain, bringing up the words of that great mind perverted genius after whom the place is named. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean. Man marks the earth with ruin. His control stops with the shore. Now who this traveler in 1885 is quoting is in fact a very famous and well-known uh, and popular poet at the time whose name was Lord Byron. And our traveller, like many people at the time at the end of the 19th century, was under the misunderstanding that Cape Byron and Byron Bay had in fact been named after or in honour of Lord Byron the poet. Unfortunately for all of them, they were completely wrong. In fact, this very spot had been given the name Byron before Lord Byron was even born. And it had been given that name by a figure we know well in Australian history, Captain James Cook. Now, Captain Cook came sailing along the east coast of what's now New South Wales in the year 1770. And on the 15th of May, he passed this rocky headland, an enormous piece of land which stretched out into the Pacific further than any other part along the mainland coast that he'd explored so far. Now this was a, a bright clear day and as he was going around the corner into what became Byron Bay it seems that he saw something quite familiar to the locals of this area still. Dolphins jumping out of the water. Beautiful sight especially for sailors back then it was seen to be a lucky thing to find dolphins jumping around the ship. And he looked at those dolphins and decided to give the rocky mass that was jutting out into the water, the name Byron. Now, why is that? Well, Captain Cook was a big explorer, but he wasn't the first explorer. He had his own role models who'd explored the world before him, especially English sea captains. And he was particularly influenced by another explorer whose name, well, his nickname known in the Navy was Foul Weather Jack. Now, Foul Weather Jack had got that name in the middle of the 18th century because he always seemed to find himself in shipwrecks and nasty weather and somehow make it out alive. In fact, he was in a terrible shipwreck off the coast of Chile, which if you go right across the Pacific from where we are, you'll probably hit. He also circumnavigated the world and this was a big feat. This was something that was really celebrated at the time. Captain Cook had read the journals of Foul Weather Jack and he was very impressed by this man's uh, explorative spirit. Now, Foul Weather Jack was his nickname, but his real name was Captain John Byron. Captain John Byron's ship in which he circumnavigated the world was called the Dolphin. So it seems that on the 15th of May, about 250 years ago, 
as Captain Cook entered these waters, he saw some dolphins and it reminded him of the ship dolphin and the captain of that ship, his hero, John Byron. So he gives this rocky peninsula the name that will stick throughout history, Cape Byron. Now that's not Lord Byron, but it is Lord Byron's grandfather. John Byron, the famous captain, after a couple of generations is superseded by his much more famous romantic poet grandson, Lord Byron. By the time that Europeans started to move into this area, see the great benefits of this safe harbour and also the lush lands behind Byron Bay and how they could create a settlement with a jetty, a port, a town if you like that could develop here. Everybody at that point thought, hey, it must be named after Lord Byron, the poet. So they decided, we'll follow suit and we'll name all sorts of things after poets. We'll keep in the spirit. Of course, this was a great misapprehension, but it stuck through the titles of different things in Byron that we'll talk about. One of the other great features of Byron Bay that is named after the misconception that the whole place was referring to Lord Byron the poet are these islands out here. Now, today we know them as Julian Rocks, but that wasn't always their name. In fact, in 1885, when our traveller visits this area, he has this to say about them. Running northeast from the point of the Cape and some distance out to sea are two islands. They stand alone and in their lon loneliness amidst the stormy waves of the Pacific are like two tried and tested friends standing together and battling with the world. These two islets, Juan and Julia rocks, stand there, a monument to the stupendous power of nature. Juan and Julia rocks. Now, where would a strange name like that come from on the east coast of Australia? Once again, it was our friend Lord Byron who influenced the original name for these islands. We don't know who gave them this name, but someone wanted to honour the poet and honour the poet's poems, because one of Lord Byron's most famous poems is called Don Juan. And Don Juan is about a guy in the Mediterranean who basically travels around is seduced by women, seduces women. He's a bit of a Casanova types type. And his most famous lover is known as Julia. Juan and Julia have an affair, but it's not to be. She's another man's wife. And they break up. Forlorn, they try to be together, but their love must be separated. And whoever came up with the idea to call these two rocks, Juan and Julia, thought that they represented the two lovers, together at heart, but slightly separated there out in the sea. Juan and Julia Rocks was the name for the Rocky Islands at the end of the 19th century, but it's quite a long and unusual name. And of course, we like to shorten things to make it easier in Australia. So sometime in the early 20th century, perhaps a lazy fisherman decided to join the two names together. Juan and Julia Rocks became Julian Rocks. Simple, one word, who was Julian? Nobody. Basically, just a uh, a version, an Australianization of the original name given to these ones, referring to Lord Byron and his poem Don Juan, which is all fanciful anyway, because it wasn't named after the poet whatsoever. Lord Byron's influence on Byron Bay didn't just stop with the natural features. In fact, when they laid out the small township here in the 1880s, they decided, hey, let's run with this poetry theme. Let's name each street after a different poet. Behind me, the main street of Byron Bay is Johnson Street, named after Ben Johnson, a 17th century English poet and playwright. You've got Keats Street, Shirley Street, Burn Street, after my favourite Scottish poet, Robbie Burns. They also named a few after Australian poets of the 19th century. Patterson Street for Banjo Patterson, Lawson Street for Henry Lawson. In fact, the whole place is blooming with poetic sounding names and people, all under the misunderstanding that Byron Bay itself had been named after Lord Byron. 136 years ago, when the township of Byron Bay was still yet to be developed, our traveler to the area had this to say. One thinks how man in his efforts to improve spoils nature. He wrecks the beautiful to procure convenience. Following up this train of thought, one wonders if this lovely scene will ever be a hive of industry. Whether where glorious vegetation now luxuriates, smoking stacks of chimneys and busy factories will rear their heights towards the sky. 
one wonders if in the years to come, where now a solitary traveller winds his way north, south or inland, myriads will travel. Where now there is only the bridle path or bush track, there the iron horse, which is the railway, will speed its fiery way into the other haunts of man. Is this dream a wild or extravagant one? When one looks at the beneficent way in which a good nature has lavishly handed out its gifts to this district, no, decidedly no, he says. No one can doubt for one solitary moment that Byron Bay has not a grand future before it and that progress must be its watchword. I'm Max Burns McCroovy, a local guide and historian of Byron Bay and the hinterland behind it, and I can't wait to share more stories and scenery with you.